Welcome everybody to the Black Museum lecture on uh, the cultural history of the zombie. Um, we are the Black Museum. Uh, my name is Paul Korup and this is Andrew Subasadi and we started this lecture series um, one year ago, last fall, at the Big Picture Cinema in the East End. And since then we've had about, we've done 10 lectures, five last fall, five in the spring on horror related topics. So what we are here today to do is to provide a little bit of taste of what we do. Um, our next season starts September 26th and we're going to be announcing uh, our next five lectures um, at that time. But uh, first we just, we just kind of want to give you, uh, Andrew did this lecture in the first semester and uh, this is kind of a condensed 30 minute version. The full version actually ran about two hours. But it's full of clips and, and uh, fun stuff, so let's, let's play our trailer. Let's play our trailer first. First, you can get a little bit of an idea of what we do, and then uh, I'll pass it over to Andrew. Courtesy of Post No Joe's Productions. Enjoy. Oh, we're, we're having some audio issues, so we weren't able to get it working. for the technological difficulties, challenges. Um, I'm going to be doing that for the clips, but I think you're going to recognize these clips. This turnout is remarkable, by the way. I think when I initially did the full two and a half hour lecture, I had maybe a third of this people, and that's what I'm getting paid, right? So, just so you know how lucky you are. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be doing a really short version of the lecture I delivered at the Black Museum in October of 2012, and it's based on my master's thesis research I did in 2007. And, uh, and back then, there was just a little bit of evidence that there was a zombie craze, that it was just kind of starting. So I really had to convince my supervisor to let me write on zombies as a topic. I had to convince him that zombies were important in Western culture and that they meant something special to us. I mean, now, in 2013, you can't walk 50 feet without seeing something zombie related, am I right? Especially downstairs. That's right. <laughs> like a poster for a zombie prom or a USB key that looks like a finger. Like how many of you have seen something like this in stores? Now, I probably own everything on this slide and I wish it wasn't true, but once you're a zombie expert, the gift flow starts kind of going in this way. So in order to truly understand why these brain eaters are resonating so strongly with our culture, we need to take a step back and look at where they came from. They weren't always cartoony and cute, and they weren't always brain eaters and scary, but I'll get to that later. So before I could investigate the why of zombies, I needed to prove that they were culturally important, and I came up with three reasons to this end. So one is their origin. The zombie was essentially constructed out of Western racism, so it's no wonder that they make for such great satire. Two is the social commentary that we see, like in the work of George Romero. In Romero's films, the zombies aren't really the villains. They just provide the circumstance for humanity to show their monstrous side. And third is the cultural response to the zombie is totally unprecedented. Like, have you ever seen a vampire walk? Or a werewolf prom? 
there's something special about zombies that are getting people literally on their feet, and that's something worthy of analysis. So I've only got a little while today. I'm going to take you through the origin story of the zombie from its humble beginnings in Haiti to its humble re-beginnings in a shopping mall in Pittsburgh. So once a time, there was a Canadian fellow named Wade Davis. And Wade Davis was an ethnobotanist out of Harvard, which means that he looked at how different cultures used plants as medicine and whatnot. Um, so he was working out of Harvard in 1980 when his department started receiving rumors that people in Haiti were rising from the grave. Specifically, the case of a man called Clervius Narcisse, who was reported to have been seen wandering around his village a full 18 years after being declared dead and buried. And I have a picture here of that's him in front of his own grave, which is something you don't see every day, and that's his uh, death certificate. So the eggheads at Harvard figured that a sort of toxin was being used, something that mimics a death-like state in people, and then they can be revived at a later time. Um, and I have a quote here from Davis describing what they were looking for. He writes, theoretically at least, it was completely conceivable that a drug might exist which, if administered in proper dosage and in some tenable manner, would lower the metabolic state of the victim to such a level that he or she might be considered dead. In fact, however, the victim would remain alive, and an antidote, properly administered, could then restore him at an appropriate time. Now, the nerds figured that this drug might be useful in the field of anesthesia, so Davis himself went over to Haiti to investigate. Now, from that research, Wade Davis produced two books on the topic of zombies. And the first was in 1985. It was a book called The Serpent in the Rainbow. And it's written in a very narrative tone, very conversational, describing his experiences in Haiti and getting to know the locals and getting to know the truth. It's very readable and fun. Some of you are probably familiar with the Wes Craven film by the same name, starring Bill Pullman. Uh, and then in 1988, he published a full ethno-biological account of his trip, and he called it Passage of Darkness. Now, this book is a full-on referenced account of Haitian voodoo culture. Um, he really goes in depth um, about the how, and most importantly, the why of zombie making. And it's academic, but it's really interesting, and if you want to know more about the Haitian voodoo zombie that I'm about to tell you, that's the book to pick up. So the movie adaptation of The Serpent in the Rainbow came out the same year that Passage of Darkness came out, and the, book, the movie isn't terribly loyal to the book. In fact, the movie kind of reinforces some negative stereotypes that Wade Davis had hoped to disprove, but it's Wes Craven, so you have to forgive him. So now I have a clip from the movie, and this is where the ethnographer called Dr. Allen, played by Bill Pullman, is meeting his first real-life zombie. Good memory. Tell us what you remember. 
us and we can stop the Bokos from doing this to anybody else. Help us, Christopher. scene Wade Davis went to Haiti and he got cozy enough with the locals until he was able to track down this poison. Now the poison contains one real active pharmaceutical ingredient called tetrodotoxin and it's derived naturally in a certain species of blowfish. You might have heard of fugu, the sushi that's a prepared from this puffer fish. The toxin affects the neuromuscular system and causes complete paralysis and it's one of the most poisonous substances known to humanity. At one time, it was considered pretty ballsy to order it in a sushi shop because if it wasn't prepared properly, you become the fish food. Anyway, uh, the zombie poison has a good dosage of this stuff mixed together with symbolic ingredients like shavings of human bones and also an irritant, usually ground glass. And the idea was that this concoction is administered on the doorstep of the intended victim and gets absorbed through the soles of their feet. Um, and the victim enters a sudden paralysis and drops dead, as far as anyone can tell. But in fact, they can be revived later with an antidote. And as you can imagine, it's a pretty wild ride. They wake up pretty brain dead, and they're usually sold as slaves to neighboring farms or plantations. Now, this is the scientific explanation for zombification, but Wade Davis discovered that the Vodun understood it very differently. For the Vodun, zombies are human beings who have had their souls captured and they're just empty vessels and incapable of acting on their own will. The soul is called the Tsibonange, you might have heard it in that clip, and it's believed that the Bokor, or witch doctor, who prepared the poison, gains control of the victim Tsibonange and keeps it in a jar and has the power to release it later, if they choose. So here I have some images of the Bokors in Haiti preparing their ingredients. And it's kind of hard to see, but they're wearing bandanas on their faces, or they've got like, Kleenex jammed up their nostrils so they don't absorb any of the poison by accident. And on the right, you can see somebody's actually grating bones into a powder, the way we might grate cheese. So I have here a clip, another clip from Passage of Darkness where they're actually making the zombie poison. Serpent, what did I say? Passage. They knew what I meant. The ingredients are the powder. There's the poisonous sea toad in full marinas, the same animal Lucretia Borgia used, made even more toxic by frightening it with a stinging sea worm, and the puffer fish, which produces one of nature's most powerful poisons, to trout a toxin, plus a whole pharmacy of herbs, minerals, charred and ground and mixed with a skill is astonishing. All of this is woven together with a net of magic beyond anything. probably tell that that's a little bit glamorized. I don't know why they need fire hands <laughs> to make a poison. I don't really get it. Um, 
So now I know what you're all thinking. You're all wondering how you can turn your ex or your landlord or your boss into a zombie, am I right? Well, the bad news is that a book whore won't do it for just anyone. If you want somebody zombified, you have to plead your case with the Bizango secret society and prove that your perpetrator deserves such an extreme and brutal punishment. And within the Vodun community, there's a number of things you can do um, to get you in trouble, including adultery, blasphemy, or even just being a jerk in general. In the case of Clairvius Narcisse, he believed that he had been turned into a zombie because he was in a land dispute with his brother. And land disputes between family members is a really big deal among the Vodouns, so somebody decided to take him out. So to recap, in Haiti, zombification was a punishment for crimes against the community. And this is a significant difference between the zombies in Haiti and the flesh eaters that we know. In Haiti, the concept of someone's tibonage or soul being under the control of an outside being is what is terrifying for them. They don't fear zombies, they're only afraid of becoming one, unlike the Americanized zombie who's a pretty big threat to anyone within arm's reach. Behaving yourself can protect a Haitian from becoming a zombie, but no one is safe from the American undead. And these distinctions have really important cultural implications, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So the first implication has to do with culpability, or deserving your misfortune. If you ask the Vodun, Haitian zombies deserve what's happening to them. They did the crime, they had their case heard, and now they're paying the price. In American horror movies, the zombie epidemic doesn't differentiate between the guilty and the innocent. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're getting bitten, you're eating brains, and that's it. Um, some of our favorite zombies in Western films are those who were particularly unthreatening people before they undied. So I've got a picture here of like, we've got child princess zombies, housewife zombies, and I've got the famous Hare Krishna zombie from Dawn of the Dead still clutching his tambourine. Now, these aren't evil people we would ever be afraid of, so why would they deserve to be turned into zombies? For a clue to the answer to that question, I have here a clip from Day of the Dead, which is Romero's third installment from the series. So yeah, that's uh, it's kind of heavy. Drink to that tea. Are you guys able to hear all of that? Because I don't think I could imitate that accent. Basically, he was trying to say that uh, that maybe God is punishing us. Maybe we got a little bit too big for our britches trying to figure his shit out. And the idea that we've been spurned by God, and this is why the dead are rising, definitely suggests that maybe the Western world deserves it on a cultural scale. And why might this be? At this point in history, we're all pretty well aware that the luxury that we live in compared to the rest of the world comes at the expense of somebody far, far away. Now, I don't care if you're vegan or if you compost or if you wear plastic bags on your feet. Uh, our everyday actions living in this society has far-reaching implications overseas. And we know this and we've kind of, we've learned to live with it and accept it. Now, many of George Romero's zombie movies tap into this idea of doomsday, that there's a day of reckoning coming where we have to pay for all the luxury that we've taken for granted. And instead of leeching sustenance off other cultures, we're literally devouring our own children and neighbors. And the underlying implication is if, as a species, it's only a matter of time before we consume ourselves completely, and maybe we deserve to go by the mouthful. 
Which brings me to my next point. Another big difference between the Haitian voodoo zombie and its Americanized counterpart is the fact that the American zombie condition is contagious via bite. If an American zombie bites you, you become a zombie. And if a Haitian zombie bites you, well, you won't become a zombie, but you should probably still get a shot or something. Um, contagion and contamination have always played a large role in racist discourse. And throughout Western history, European whites have used it to justify mistreating indigenous populations. You know, we said that the natives were savages, that they were genetically inferior and rattled with contagious disease that would infect the purer race. Now, obviously, it's all nonsense. The colonists were scared of the natives, so they invented reasons to marginalize them on a basic animal level. But when this is applied to zombies who come from a Haitian background, the idea of a bite being able to turn innocent victims into zombies is just a really convenient metaphor for an old racist ideology. Which brings us to the third interesting difference between the Haitian zombie and the American one, which is the cannibal trait. Now, cannibalism is considered an unspeakable horror, something that is against the very foundation of humanity. So naturally, it's something that European whites attributed to the native. And just like all the other allegations I've mentioned, this one is largely <coughs> bullshit. Many post-colonial scholars have argued that reports of cannibalism have been exaggerated, to say the least, but nonetheless it endures as a symbol in savagery in horror movies, something that marks a boundary between the civilized and the primitive. Now, not only is it another racist claim applied to zombies, but cannibalism is also a common metaphor for consumerism. Um, hearkening back to my earlier point about culpability. Now, the Marxist critique of capitalism described a societal system where one class benefits by exploiting another. Marx predicted that this system would eventually devour itself because when human beings are reduced to commodities, they're nothing but fuel or food. Now, the cannibal trait is one of the earliest characteristics of the other, and so it's often used as a metaphor in horror film, particularly in American horror. So moving on from this, let's recap. Historically, North American white colonists were afraid of native populations, so they accused them of being dangerous. They accused them of being contagious, and they accused them of being cannibals. Now, what do we call evil, infectious flesh eaters today? Zombies. And that's how we went from this to this. Racist conceptions of the other built out of fear. Now, I'm not saying this is anything intentional. I'm not trying to say that George Romero is a raging white supremacist or that independence era colonist or anything like that. In fact, I really think the opposite is true. I think in his movies, the zombies aren't the biggest threat. In Night of the Living Dead, out of six characters, only one of them is actually killed by a zombie, and even then, it's a human being's fault. <laughs> Romero's ghouls reflect the monstrosity from the zombies to the humans, and I really get the impression that Romero is pointing a satirical finger right at the kind of racist discourses I'm talking about. How many of the classic monsters in American horror represent a particular cultural preoccupation with something that's bothering us on a cultural scale? In horror movies, we tend to take this terrifying other and exaggerate their differences from us to the point of monstrosity. And this is exactly what we're seeing in zombie movies when we compare the original Haitian zombie to its Americanized counterpart. But what's unique about the modern zombie movie is how filmmakers like Romero are able to use and tweak and reuse the figure of the zombie so that it's like a sympathetic other to illustrate the monstrosity of humanity, which is part of what makes him so important to the genre. So I'm about to wrap up. I'm just going to give you a little summary. Basically, zombies are real. You can walk out of here and tell anyone who will listen that zombies are really real. They existed in Haiti, and they were punishment for social transgressions among the Vodun. Now, the key thematic differences between the Haitian Vodun zombie and the Americanized flesh-eating zombie are culpability, the idea that anyone can be turned into a zombie without trial, contagion, the idea that the condition can be spread, and cannibalism, the fact that the zombies eat people now. All three traits can be traced back to racist ideology and what was used to oppress indigenous populations. And what happens when you bring black mythology into America? 
We call them dangerous, and we call them contagious, and we call them cannibals. And what Romero did, whether intentionally or not, was he reimagined these monsters to fit the American context and show what monsters we can be under the right circumstances. So if you'd like to read up more about Wade Davis, and who wouldn't, right? Uh, I strongly recommend, oh, I have another clip. Let's watch another clip. I think I just threw this in because it's my favorite clip of all time from all of Romero's zombie movies. And uh, this one features Ken Forey, who you might see wandering around this here Festival of Beer. And let's watch. I love that they're wearing furs while they're discussing the living dead. I think it's great. So this is what I was trying to get out. I've got further reading. This is always up on the Black Museum website. Often when we do a lecture, we provide a reading list for talking about something that you'd like to continue reading up on. Um, I strongly recommend picking up um, Passage of Darkness. It's really fascinating. And, um, and also, there's a book by Kim Paffenroth, an excellent book on Romero's films called Gospel of the Living Dead. It's fascinating stuff, highly recommend it. So if you enjoyed this mini lecture, and I hope you did, you might be interested in some other horror lecturing happening in Toronto. And it so happens that Paul and I curate this lecture series, and we have our lineup for fall that we'd like to share with you. We'll do it. I think, I think maybe we'll, let's, uh, let's mention some of the other um lectures that we've done okay. in the past uh, year. I guess uh, we've had several special uh, uh, directors and, and uh, filmmakers and critics kind of show up to talk about um, what they're interested in, what they're passionate about in the horror genre. Um, in the first season, I believe we had Steve Kostansky, who's another guest here from Astron 6, who directed, of course, Man Borg and Father's Day. Um, and he did, a, he did a really great lecture on uh, 80s stop motion animation. Um, you know all those all those crazy you know Clash of the Titans and uh, at least one of the Nightmare on Elm Street all all those were like great creatures. Yeah, um, he actually did a wicked montage of '80s horror stop motion and set it to what was it? It was like a hair band of like Def Leppard or something. You're just like, yes, I wish it was the '80s now. <laughs> uh, we, we showed uh, we had uh, 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 Stuart back. Andrews from uh, Rimwork Radio doing a, we, we showed uh, White Zombie on 16mm and he also talked, did a little zombie talk. Uh, Vincenzo Natale, director of Cube, was here talking about architecture um, in the horror film and that was really fascinating in the way he, he drew comparisons to um, architecture of, of buildings in horror films and how he used that in Cube. Yeah. Um, to create his own kind of like architecture of fear. Yeah, he showed us storyboards behind the scenes of Cube. It was cool. Do you want to talk about some of the other ones? Um, some of the other highlights? Poster, poster art? Uh, poster art was a really popular one that we did, that did last semester. Andrea Butler was our lecturer, and she's sitting right there in the front. Say hi, Andrea. Hello. <laughs> Another yeah, guest I lecture. Was, I think that was our most popular one. I think so. I think you take the cake. Although, uh, today is kind of giving you a run for your I money. Actually, I think yeah. so. Might have to fight later. Um, another super popular lecture from last semester was a found footage lecture by Alexandra West. That one was really well attended and she actually had an opportunity to travel to Boston and do a repeat of that lecture because everybody is so interested in the topic, so that was really cool. So what should we, should we Do you guys want to know what we're going to do? Um, so we are going to be releasing these classes 
course by course um, over the course of next week. I just said class and course a lot. Starting starting Monday. That's right. But we're going to show you them all now, so we're going to politely ask that if you should remember them, you keep it to yourself. If you're recording, please wait a couple of days before you post on YouTube because... This, this is just kind of a... We, we just want to give you guys a preview. Uh, you know, you, you guys showed up and we, we really appreciate that. We really just wanted to give something back and, and give you guys a head start on, you know, um, before we officially release to the public. Mm -hmm. so. so here we go. <gasps> so our first lecture is going to be Arcane Arcade. Um, and that's going to be by a guy named Jamie Love, who's a video game blogger and uh, game developer. And uh, he's going to be doing an entire history of horror in video games from kind of the, the, uh, the early Atari games all the way through to kind of the, the Silent Hill survival horror stuff and now the kind of the indie games um, like Home, I believe. Um, so that's, that is our first lecture. Second up, we've got Mark Hassan. Uh, Mark R. Hassan is a, uh, um, a soundtrack critic for uh, Reward Magazine, and he's actually um, been writing for a while on uh, the soundtracks of Dario Argento. So he's going to be coming in to, to, to talk about Black Glove Ballads, the art of the Italian giallo soundtrack, and he'll be talking with about, um, like Ennio Morricone and uh, Stelvio Ciparani, and will. That actually happens to be the night before uh, Goblin is going to be playing the Opera House the following evening. So it, 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 if you're planning on going to that, this would be a really great opportunity to really learn about um, that whole era. I don't know why, I just talked for like half an hour. <coughs> That's true. Okay. <laughs> um, for our Halloween lecture um, this year, we, we've tried to tie it in a bit how, to uh, Halloween. We've got Alex Cavanaugh, who's a costume designer, who's worked on a lot of uh, different Canadian films, including uh, several, like all the Saw sequels, I think she did. Repo the Genetic Opera, she was a costume designer for as well. And uh, so she's going to be coming in and she's going to be doing a history of Halloween costumes, and she's going to be talking about how that history has tied into the work that she does actually creating outfits for horror films. And fine. Oh, no. Not finally. Two more. And we're trying something new this year. Um, it, it, we are actually not doing um, five lectures. We're doing four lectures in this event. This is the, our, our new thing called the Black Museum Debate Club. And we're going to be bringing in four separate teams to talk about their favorite Stephen King movie adaptation. So we're going to have everybody present their case, tell you why the film that they chose, the Stephen King adaptation film that they chose, is the greatest Stephen King adaptation of all time. And uh, it's going I don't know about you guys, but I've had many a drunken brawl <laughs> over this very topic, it's and I very would throw down any time. So it's this is going to be hairy. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. Even you know, um, it's going to be I think our most free kind of like fun event that we uh, that we have ever done. So uh, we're all really looking forward to this, and and we'll be announced. I, I guess we'll we'll uh, we'll get into the teams uh, next week, but I I, I think some people. Well, we have a mix of kind of old people and new people. I, I believe um, Steve Kostansky will be back for this one. Correct. Um, Alex West, once Alex, again. Alex West will be back for this. Gary Pullen. Gary Pullen from Reward Magazine, or uh, artist and expert from, from Reward Magazine. And finally, Wolf of Wombs, Pregnancy and the Horror Film. Uh, we have a very... We're, we're really proud to have a, a great female audience that always comes in, and we, we uh, are really happy to do this one, I, I think. Uh, Kiva Reardon is a uh, Toronto-based uh, film critic and writer. She runs a feminist online film journal called Clio, and uh, this was uh, what she really wanted to do, and I, I think it's going to be a really fascinating thing. She's going to be talking about Rosemary's Baby. She's going to be talking about uh, L'Interieur, um, Aliens 3, and all the kind of themes about body horror and that, that come out of this topic. So we're that's that's our five lectures, and we're really excited to present these. Um, so we'll be announcing these, as I said, uh, online next week. Um, every there'll be one per day, and uh, we're at theblackmuseum.com. I think tickets are twelve dollars in advance. Correct. So and and we sell them all for all through the uh, all all through until the uh, until the lecture. That's right, you can also buy a membership for all five, like the entire semester for $50, which brings the price down to 10 bucks a piece, and we'll be releasing that 
as a possibility on the website. And if you need a reminder of the website, we've got flyers up here, we've got pins, we've got fun stuff to look at, so come look at it. We've got a little bit of time though, so if you guys have any questions, be it about my lecture or about our lineup, then go for it. There's one in the back, what's up? No. <laughs> uh, well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a on a book called How to Create a Zombie. You'll recognize that um, it is an attempt at Soviet Russian propaganda back into the wars. Um, Maria Kaneko decided to come up with an idea to bring Russian soldiers back to life. Of course, this is propaganda, but he did manage to bring severed dog heads back to life. Based on what your thesis is here, that um, zombies are um, mostly part of culture and part of um, someone talking about someone else in savagery or um, cannibalism. Do you think that this counts as zombieism, bringing people actually back to life physically, with using using um, a machine called an autojector? But do you believe that if you can bring a person back to life, it's immediately zombies? Um, it's kind of a different uh, philosophy set, like the kind of Frankenstein-style zombie back from the dead, and I don't, I don't know if you guys were at the reanimator panel that I did this morning, we were kind of talking about that too. I don't think it has the same roots in, uh, in racism, it's more... Uh, I mean, sorry, the real question I want to ask is, if they don't eat flesh, and they don't, like, so you might have already answered this, so they if they don't eat flesh, and they don't have, like, brain on the body, then are they still a zombie? I'd say so. I think my argument in this lecture is basically that the word zombie has been transformed as it kind of crossed over the ocean into America. So, uh, you know, in film we've seen so many permutations of the zombie that they're getting fast now, and they're getting smart, and they're getting organized, and they're getting this and that. So it's, it's an ever-evolving thing that I think is still under the umbrella of zombie. But again, that's another point that I fought about. Fast or slow zombies, right? Yeah, it is. Sick of that question. <laughs> You're not going to ask that, are you? What? Just no, kidding. No, no, no. Go ahead. Um, do you have anywhere you can see the past lectures that you've done? Do you have them like online if you have a DVD or something? Well, that's hey, an interesting ask. question. Yeah. Um, no. I mean, <laughs> right now, no. Um, hopefully, that we will have something to announce. Um, within the next two weeks. We're working on it. We're, we're, we're working on it, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, because that, that is definitely one of the biggest questions we always get is is people from not in Toronto saying, I, or people who are, and I'm sure many of you are here are not from Toronto, uh, how can I see these? And we will hopefully have a solution for you soon. Mm -hmm. uh, another one right here, Black Shirt. Um, so I was gonna, you kind of just answered my question, but do you know of anybody else similar to you, kind of in the States, that might do this in the States? Um, not in the States. We have a sister organization out of Montreal. The Black Museum is actually based on a model. It's called the Miskatonic Institute of Horror Studies. That's out of Montreal, and they do uh, they do courses similar. I'm not aware of anything in the States. Yeah, they, they actually do more of a classroom kind of thing. So it's like you, you sign up for a class, and it's six weeks, and you come every Tuesday night. Um, we, we just... We, we were trying something a little bit different because we think the lectures are a little bit more fun and you, there's no real commitment. You get you know show up for one and you don't have to you know you don't you're not obligated to come again. And we've got beer. And we've got beer. <laughs> um, yeah. And right next to you, there's another question. Um, how do you think that the uh, traditional Haitian zombie got translated into our modern day? Um, see, that's kind of, it's a, it's a complicated question, it's a great question, did you guys all hear it? Um, she was basically asking how it happened, if it was kind of a concerted effort. I think, if you listen to interviews with Romero, he's going to say that he didn't do it on purpose, you know, he's going to say stuff like that, but I think it's just kind of, it's something that's in the Western American psyche. I think he wanted, to, he doesn't even call them zombies ever in Romero's films. Um, he refers to them as ghouls or whatever. So I think 
What I think is that he dreamed up this monster and it just happened to reflect all these societal preoccupations. That's my theory. I'm sticking to it. Thanks for your question. Right over there in the side. Um, with the popularity of The Walking Dead, both the comic and the, the TV show, do you see that as a continuation of the social commentary or is it more of a sensationalism of the zombie? Yeah. The latter. Oh, wow. That was. Did that. that Kicked on a heated discussion well, out here last. Yes, I sure did. And um, um, Stewart was here. He had some very specific thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, zombies are already dead, but lately they've been rotting. I don't know. I'm finding a lot of the uh, a lot of the zombie stuff coming out now has lost a lot of its bite, so to speak. Pardon the pun. I I, I think Stewart's point was that Romero um, said he he called The Walking Dead zombie porn. Um, because it's really about the money shots, really. So that's that's his thought of, of, of whether there's much social criticism there, and that's, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And one more in the back. Oh, it's you again. Oh, it can be. Uh, sorry, I was about to just go off the back to go. But um, one more question. Sorry to delve into your personal business, but what did you get on your thesis like uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I passed. Got a master's degree in zombieology. Uh, my master's thesis was published into a book, which is, I guess, kind of an A. Um, it's available online for 60 bucks or something ridiculous. And because it's an academic book, it's supposed to be a textbook, right? And so I figured with zombies getting so popular, there's going to be university courses teaching on zombies, and maybe that'll be part of the curriculum, and then they'll have to force like 60 people to buy my book, and I can retire and buy a place in Paris and stuff. But that, that hasn't happened yet. But uh, if you really want to get your hands on my book, you can probably link to that through the Black Museum website. Thanks for your question. There was another one right in front of you, right there. Hi. Me? Yeah, you. Uh, even with Dave Romero, what about the shift from zombies to something like the crazies, where they're not even dead anymore, but there's more of a shift with modern zombies to being just angry people? Yeah. Just, well, uh, horror films have always kind of dealt with repression. Um, especially around that period, and that was kind of a period where consumerism was just making us crazies, right? It just turned us into these frenzied masses, so I feel like that's just another example of repression. Anything else, comments? One over there, hi. Hi. Um, you based your uh, thesis with the cultural, uh, the history coming from the Haiti. Is that strictly just the voodoo aspect, or why not base it from Europe and the various uh, plagues or around Black Death and things, and people coming back to play from the dead? Uh-huh. Um, I'm sorry, your question is why didn't I because expand it to? why not go farther back? Why pick it up just from the Haitian point, unless it was strictly related to the new religion? Um, well, I guess the main argument of my thesis, and not so much my lecture, was uh, was about the importance of zombies in Western life today. So the backdrop of Haiti and uh, and the connections to Western racism was just kind of a backdrop to that. Um, my actual thesis and book wasn't a cultural history. It, it was a bit more situated in the present. But for the purposes of this mini lecture, I thought I would take the juiciest part of my book and give it to you because it's fun. But um, but yeah, I'm sure the research is out there, and I'd love to see it, because I think you're right. I think there's a lot of analogy to other cultures going on. OK, well, I guess that's perfect, because we're kind of out of time. But come grab yourself a flyer. Come grab yourself a pin. Visit us online. If you have any questions, we'll be around ourselves.